It's Friday, Feedback Friday, the feedback day of the week. Ha! It's Feedback Friday. And I'm happy this Feedback Friday because I got some compliments on how positive the comments are in uh, this YouTube channel. It's always happy. Always makes me happy. Happy jazz hands. Yeah, happy. Um, when I get those, because this is something that I feel very strongly about. I feel like this this element is what is going to help this channel grow because people, you know, I don't have the traffic to compete with some of the other YouTube channels out there. But if somebody thinks they're going to have a positive experience, that gives me, you know, an edge. And I think that's very important. And above that all, I think it's very important that people can come to somewhere and feel like they can speak um, without getting dogpiled and, and brigaded and all that stuff. And I do want to give a shout out this week to Kotaku in Action, who doesn't, that Reddit doesn't tend to get a lot of love, but I just happened to pop on, just, just out of curiosity, I'm, I was curious about how that board is handling sort of the insane state of U.S. politics right now. Um, but they, I saw a thing about them amending their rules to try to combat, and it's very hard, but try to combat what they call witch hunts, dogpiling, brigading, calls to arms, things like that. And I just really want to give them credit for actively at least trying to cut down on that and a seeming understanding of the issue because so few Reddit boards or Reddit, sorry, do that. And so credit where credit's due. I appreciate that step on that board. Um, and that's sort of, you know, I, I have had my, how do I put this? I have had my disagreements with that board. Um, now this may be uh, seen as what some commenters this week there's sometimes there's this whole conversation among themselves and these uh, few commenters who are in agreement that i just wave off criticism and I come across as a goddamn ideologue and all this stuff and it's funny because other people insist i'm too sensitive and and pay too much attention to criticism so this this implies i'm right in the right spot i make a point of at least trying to do some things and so it would be great critics if you could at least look at the fact that I am trying and ease up a little about the fact that I can't possibly get to everyone. If you have a question about a specific topic that has not been answered for whatever reason, it's probably that I just missed it. Don't go assuming that I'm ignoring you. Uh, there are some people I do ignore because they haven't done anything wrong per se. They haven't, you know, gone on personal attacks with, with people, um, to, to the level I find a problem. I, I try to be a little bit forgiving on the personal attack thing, because I think there's a lot of people that need to learn what a personal attack actually is. If you, I consider it wrong for you to make assumptions about a person's motivation. If you say it appears that way, or this is the issue, like actually talk about something I said, that's one thing, but to assume what's in my head, you can't do that. You cannot know what is in my head. So drop the conspiracy theories, please. I'm not gonna ban anyone for that or anything like that. This is something I think that just sort of has to be worked on for a while. Um, but one, one person, and, and th this is the comment that led people into saying, I wave off criticism and I sound like a goddamn ideologue that's plaguing gamers. And blah, blah. Uh, they also accused me of saying that Trump and Gamergate are evil, c coming close to saying that. And that actually really pissed me off because I have been blackballed by a lot of games sites because I would not declare Gamergate evil. I mean, anybody who's seen the crash override leaks, there were active 
at least boasts that people were talking to previous editors of mine because I would not declare Gamergate the great Satan. So comments like that just tell me that the commenter does not know what they are talking about. But because I have, I have suffered so much career damage because of that, that accusation hurts. And unfortunately, there are too many punishments in the games industry for having an unpopular opinion. And it is nuts to me that the unpopular opinion in this case is let's disregard all the stuff about who slept with who and, and all that stuff, because that doesn't matter. But let's address these accusations of collusion these claims that, you know, the game's press needs to step it up better. Let's talk about that. And I really think that if we'd talked about it on a greater, on a greater level, instead of screaming and demonizing each other, then we could have learned something and we could have actually improved things. But that involves an understanding of nuance. And the thing that kicked off this whole hate brigade uh, on this particular thing was my comment about Hillary Clinton's original basket of deplorables comment and what she was actually trying to say that backfired in, in, this, uh, in this instance. So I want to address that. And I wish that the people involved in this little circle whatever had just asked instead of launching into this massive conspiracy theory, accusing me of a whole bunch of stuff they could not possibly know. And because I, here's the transcript right here. And for the record, this is responding to a critic who was not especially nice to me, but I'm going to respond to the meat of the comment because it was there. So, you know, for all your, I just wave off criticism, here goes. This is the, this is the, the comment she made. This is the transcript, the full thing, not parsed by anything. This is what it is. And keep in mind, this was made to an LGBTQ group supporting her candidacy. So it, it, it doesn't excuse outright hate baiting. But that context is important here. But this is what she says. Um, I know there are only 60 days left to make our case. And don't get complacent. Don't see the latest outrageous, offensive, inappropriate comment and think, well, he's done this time. We are living in a volatile political environment. You know, just to be grossly generalistic, you could put half of Trump supporters into what I call the basket of deplorables, right? The racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, Islamophobic, you name it. And unfortunately, there are people like that, and he's lifted them up, and he has given voice to their websites that used to only have 11,000 people and now 11 million. He tweets and retweets their offensive, hateful, mean-spirited rhetoric. Now, some of those folks, they are irredeemable, but thankfully they are not America. But the other basket... And I know this because I see friends from all over America here. I see friends from Florida and Georgia and South Carolina and Texas, as well as, you know, New York and California. But that other basket of people are people who feel that the government has let them down. The economy has let them down. Nobody cares about them. Nobody worries about what happens to their lives and their futures. And they're just desperate for change. It doesn't really even matter where it comes from. They don't buy everything he says, but he seems to hold out some hope that their lives will be different. They won't wake up and see their jobs disappear, lose a kid to heroin, feel like they're in a dead end. Those are people we have to understand and empathize as, with as well. That is the entirety of her statement on the basket of deplorables. So for that person who was like, oh, really? That, you know, what, what, oh, I'd love to hear this. That was basically the comment. It's right there. Like, she was attempting to empathize with the other type of Trump supporter. And in a classic alt-right tactic that the entire media fell for, it became this discussion about whether 
half of Trump supporters were actually deplorables. And the Trump campaign played this to the hilt. They're still playing it. And that's fine. That is their job. A huge part of you know, political sur surrogacy is to make the other candidate look bad. And if the media is not going to call them on their nonsense and say, she also said that these are people we have to empathize and understand as well, you know, that's not the fault of the Trump surrogates. That is the media massively dropping the ball because it is a better story to, oh, Hillary Clinton called them all deplorables. And yes, it is a pitfall in the age of the internet to say half what she was saying is that there is one portion that is undeniably, and what she meant was people like David Duke and Stormfront, okay? Like, they have undeniably warmed to Donald Trump. They are there. And these are the people that a group like an LGBTQ group would see as an unequivocal sign that Trump supporters are all evil. And what she was trying to say, and it's a, it's a rhetorical device that doesn't work well in the age of tweets, but what she was trying to do is say, I'll give you that. I'll give you that there are some Trump supporters that are just, yeah, but there are others that aren't. And they just want their lives to be better. And that's fair. That's what she was trying to say. And it got lost. And this is the kind of crap that I'm like, people say there's a pro-Clinton bias in the news. They completely chopped off the second part of that statement. And then I, I watched her campaign try to explain it. And like, nope, 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 you said it. You really think half of Trump's, you know, half of Trump supporters are deplorable? And they walked back the half and it didn't matter. And at some point, in politics and it and in life you just cut your losses and stop fighting it but we live in an age where the original source text exists facts are facts you know i cannot quote everything i reference in a video because something like a transcript guys if you care that much go look it up if I'm saying, you know, this part of this, the actual purpose of this, and you're like, oh, really? And you care about it that much? Go look it up. If you think I'm wrong, provide evidence that I'm wrong. And evidence does not mean something from the Daily Caller, the Blaze, or Breitbart. Those are partisan services. And then the question is, what is a nonpartisan service? Well, they are out there. And I understand why gamers don't trust CNN. There's reasons for it. And I understand that gamers don't trust the New York Times. But there are these things like history books and direct feeds, direct transcripts, and direct video of speeches. They're there. The, the first person information, the best possible information you can have is out there free for the public and people don't use it because, and it's the, the science on this is really interesting, but the awareness that it is there seems to mean people don't go look. And I get that people are busy and I get that you may not want to go look it up. It takes too long, but then don't argue. Don't argue someone who is bothered to do it. If you want to ask for clarification, fine, but don't brush it off out of hand. That solves nothing. That's just insulating your own echo chamber against any potential noise from outside, right? Like that's how certain media outlets twist information. And you know what? I'll say most media outlets do that because they don't check. They don't quality control. I mean, the the stuff about VR sexual assault that CNN did this week is a prime example of that. But I'm going to save that to next week because I just have not had the time. All my content was was full to this week. So I'm going to save that to next week. Let's move on to our experiment for the week. The um, feminist uh, terminologies. And... I'll get, I'll get to the direct request. Somebody asked me to define problematic. They said, I wish you'd defined problematic. Oh, 
I've been through this quite a bit. And I'm tired of even talking about it myself. But I hate the word problematic simply because the meaning has changed. I'm going to go, you know, when I was in school, when I was a young sonny, I don't want to come across as old because I understand that the meanings of words change. And so I don't want to seem like an elitist or anything like that. But the way I was introduced to the word problematic, the way I was told to use it, was the difference in academic writing versus op-ed writing. In op-ed writing, your job is to persuade. Your intent is to speak strongly and with conviction and not use words that hedge. So you don't use the passive voice. You don't use maybes or possiblys unless you don't want to get sued. The word allegedly matters so much. But in academic writing, you can't say something is a problem unless you can prove it. For instance, we can say that that heavy use over a long period of time of television, a lot of watching TV, doesn't matter what it is, a lot of watching TV, can lead people to or does lead people, heavy users of television, to believe the world is a more dangerous, more negative place than it actually is. We know that because we have a study that was replicated that shows this. What we cannot say is that television makes the, the majority of people violent or makes the majority of people sexist or makes the majority of people want to go out and rape people. We cannot prove that causation. And so the people that stick to that, they say problematic, that there is problematic content on television because we can't come right out and say it's a problem. There's no proof. But based on what they interpret cultivation theory to say, there is fair reason to suspect that this could be a problem. And so because the word problematic is essentially an academic hedge word designed to not send false positives up, the appearance of it in political punditry or news drives me crazy because you hear this is problematic for the Clinton campaign. No, it's a problem. In politics, you have problems or you have you don't have problems. You don't have anything that's problematic. Problematic is a weasel word in, in media like this. Is it a problem or is it not? It's, it's a pundit's job to analyze whether something is going to be a problem or not. And so the word problematic has no place there. Now, unfortunately, the word problematic has just become a problem. And I think that is elitist as anything as well, because why say problematic, a four syllable word, when you can say problem? Can you imagine that? If you're, if you're having girl problematics, I feel bad for you, son. I got 99 problematics, but, uh, you know, it, it sounds horrible. Sounds horrible. The best way to know if you're doing strong opinion writing is to see if you can wrap it. Because you're not going to say I got 99 problematics. No, I got 99 problems. Because the whole point of that song was life sucks for black guys. And, you know, please tell me again about your first world problematics. Like, yes, okay, I'm using the wrong part of speech, but this is just, is it a problem or is it not? Pick one and stand by it. Don't use a word designed to allow you to go, I didn't say it was a problem, I just said it was problematic. You know, give me a break. It's weak speech. Now, you gotta remember before you jump on the conspiracy bandwagon that... A lot of these reporters who are out covering these politicians are very young and very inexperienced because it's a crappy job 
it's essentially an entry level position. It's journalistic hazing. You do all the garbage that more experienced journalists don't want to do because you got to do your time. But what that means, because there are fairly young people following these politicians around, the quality of reporting isn't as good as someone like Dana Bash, who's done some great reporting this campaign, or even a Megyn Kelly, who is, you know, had a trial by fire in more ways than one. You're not going to get the journalistic instincts. You're not going to get the BS meter. You know, you're not going to get the benefits that come with a more seasoned journalist. Now, the problem is, too, a lot of outlets don't want to pay seasoned reporters. They want to pay younger people who will work for less money. And so the quality of reporting has declined. And the games press got it first because the page rates, the page rates used to be something you could live on. They're not anymore. And so guess what we get? A lot of inexperienced garbage. And that, you know, then never mind that we don't have guaranteed access. I mean, God, political reporters don't even have that anymore. Politicians just cut out people who they don't like. And they all do it because they all can do it. And that started, that started with W. That started with George W. Bush in a really bad way. But the Obama administration continued it. They continued to freeze out unfriendly reporters. And that has been a big disappointment to me with the so-called no drama Obama. I mean, I knew no drama Obama was something of a hunk of crap. The White House is an inherently dramatic place. And my, my biggest, and I get why they did it. They had to set that narrative. They had to create that narrative. Like, don't forget, Obama's team was comprised of not just political operatives, but advertising people. And they knew that they had to sell the dream. They knew they had to sell that promise of hope. Well, politicians cannot promise hope. They can promise policy. But, you know, Reagan did his morning in America metaphor and Obama does his hope and all that stuff. And people buy into that because people understand that. When you start getting into the nitty gritty facts, people tend to shy away. And people tend to shy away because it's unpleasant. And, and this is what I hope to combat here. Like, come on, let's be thinking, respectful, inquisitive adults here. And if we care enough about this stuff to debate it, do our homework. And I'm going to ask a favor for the men's rights people that comment on this channel. Okay? Ease up on the circumcision stuff. And I know this is probably going to draw fire, but I'm going to ask just as a courtesy, there's a level of rhetoric and invective in that particular end of the manosphere that I just can't deal with. And this is a personal thing. I'm not saying it's wrong for you to go off in your little echo chamber corners and rail about the evils of circumcision and how it may or may not have done you wrong. You want to do that in your private conversations, you go right ahead. Don't bring it here because it is impossible for me to address that topic dispassionately. There's no way for me to get away from the idea that you are directly emasculating every male member of my family. And this is a long and difficult discussion. I know people feel very strongly on both ends of it. I don't know how many people who use words like mutilation and talk about how much pain and it's, it's an amputation and all that stuff. I don't know how many of these people have actually been to a bris. Some of you may have. Some of you haven't. There are some grotesque practices among certain wings of Jewish Orthodox communities that are unsanitary and 
Uh, I'm not going to get into those. I think those practices should be stopped. There's a point where you have to take progress over tradition. However, th that is not a, a good enough reason to deny an entire people an actual religious freedom. You can't claim to be a rights advocate and then advocate tromping on someone else's actual rights because you believe you've been harmed. Taking away someone else's rights doesn't do any good. It's just replacing one type of suppression for another. And I believe very strongly that unless you can prove actual harm, not mumbo jumbo pseudoscience, you pull off some, you know, website, but actual established science, actual proof of harm, you don't go tromping on other people's religious freedoms because that is indistinguishable from a theocratic worldview. You're believing that you have the right to set what's right for other people's families. And I just don't, you know, f as intellectual as I can be about this, you can't, it, it's, it's faulty thinking, but it's also, allow me for a moment to see, you guys come across as scary with the amount of vitriol that you address these topics with. It's not enough for you to argue the facts. There are words that just make people inherently uncomfortable. You're going overboard. And I know the response it has on me, but you know, and, and people go, oh, radical feminists do it too. Ah, both sides, ah. I, I go at radical feminists all the time, guys. You can't kick the same stump every single video. I'm talking to you right now because you are here. The rad femmes aren't. They're off in other corners of the internet trying to destroy my career. I can't have a conversation. They will not speak to me. Okay? I have tried. There's no stop. There's no, there's no having a discussion with them. For whatever reason, you guys come here. And you guys are not especially nice about it, but at least you're communicating. And I will give you that. I am just asking that you have more respect for other people's positions. And I know that a, a lot of, of male activists are coming from places of deep personal pain and they find these websites and they feel like there's a place they can be themselves. The, 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 there's a place where they're, they're finally allowed to get out from well, whatever, whatever they think is, is doing them wrong. And I understand how powerful that is. A and this is why I don't just, you know, go at men's rights ideological points the way I go at um, radical feminist points because I, I can't I can't understand what it's like to feel that way. I can talk to other people and allow them to tell their stories, but I can't tell you what it's like to be a man. So I am giving you that. I am giving you the ability to discuss your experience and have that be valid. And like I said, I have been very critical about the dork side, as I call them, because I do feel like they, they invalidate every experience that is not their own. But there is a level of invective from the manosphere that makes it really difficult to have rational conversations about this stuff. And so I am asking you to just not bring that here. You want to raise your talking points 
in reddits and all that stuff fine but this is putting you on notice that especially on the circumcision issue that is personal for me and you guys know my big rule is that if you want respect you give respect and so if people want to have a discussion those discussions have to start from a place of mutual respect and that hasn't been happening and I understand you feel aggrieved. And I understand that you feel like you haven't been taken seriously. And I understand that you feel wronged. The first step to really turning that around is to actually turn it around. Don't pay forward wrongs. If you know what it's like to be hurt, if you know what it's like to be disrespected, Use that empathy and don't do it to other people. This punching up, counter-punching, all these punch metaphors. It's, it's counterproductive. I'm, I'm not going to waste my time on people I don't feel show respect. Productive discussions have to come from a place of respect. So that's, that's why I am making this attempt. And if it continues then just you are on notice now. Those comments will be ignored because we don't do that here. There are enough people who are, are willing to, and I'm very grateful for this, willing to come here and have a respectful discussion and, and be willing to listen to a different point of view and, and who are willing to go, that's your story, here's mine, and share... And I mean, I think we had a real moment with the James Desboro interview. That was really powerful. And I'd like to do more of that. But I'm going to focus on people like that and, and not people who seem to be walking talking points. So let's, let's pivot to that. This seems like a good place to, to, to pivot to that here. I was very happy with that interview because I wanted to show that there are different sides to the people who write provocative stuff online. You can't judge a person based on the, based on one article they wrote or one blog post they write. And this is my whole big issue with the way games are discussed is that people say, well, they wrote that one thing, so I, I don't like them. They could have been having a bad day. They could have been dealing with some serious, you know, personal stuff. Some people, they could have gone off their meds. I mean, you, you cannot judge an entire person by one article. And too many people do. I know I've had it happen to me. And what I don't understand in this whole fight is why people can't just say, I disagree with what you say, e even if it's shocking. I mean, people have the right to shock. It's just the, the issue I have is that shock gets a lot of headlines. And so people forget that other types of games sell just as well, and I don't think that's even it. I just think there are too many people who would really like to be in Hollywood and really like to be doing these Oscar, you know, these Oscar bait flicks and, and they can't get in in Hollywood. And, and so they gravitate towards video games because either they know somebody who knows somebody or they just think it's easier pickings. But games, games can be very moving emotional experiences. But, you know, Kirby games and Captain Toad's Treasure Tracker are pretty awesome games themselves. And they're simple and soft and, and cuddly and, and unchallenging emotionally. They're just fun and cute and, and kind of comforting that way. And I feel like those games and games like Little Big Planet and games like, um, you know, even things like Pokemon that people compare to dogfighting 
and things like that. You're not killing anything. You're defeating them and capturing them. And, and the first time, first few times I watched Pokemon, I was like, oh my god, they're on the ground steaming. How can you hurt cute? I was kind of freaked out. But, you know, I'm, I'm not going to claim that it's anything like dog fighting because my god if you've ever if you've ever experienced dog fighting the the sounds alone haunt you it it's not the same thing at all and i get this is why gamers are very distrusting of people who they don't see as also being gamers, but the paranoia is getting in the way of, not even getting in the way, the paranoia is hurting us. And, and I've seen it happen, that these reactions, there, there are some political operatives on the right and the left that have realized that they can use those reactive tendencies in gamers rooted in trauma to make us seem like really bad people and they use that to score political points with the mainstream and raise their own profiles and this really saddens me because the media for all their pearl clutching about trauma and protecting victims and and you know sexual assaults and all that stuff they they really do beat on gamers not recognizing that that a lot of these responses come from backgrounds that involve bullying and, and, and a lot of negativity. But what I've learned, and, and this has been something that has been a, a, a thing I've seen over and over and over again in marginalized communities. You know, I've, I've seen it in, in hip hop. I've seen it in the dance hall scene. I've seen it in, um, you know, the alternative scene in the 90s, but that was co-opted very quickly to become mainstream. Uh, and now I'm, I'm seeing it in games as well. But if we don't treat ourselves right, we are setting the script for the way the rest of the world treats us. We are basically making ourselves easy targets by these very public rip and tear sessions and that doesn't mean that we can't stand up for what we believe in and we can't stand up for ourselves but in the current paradigm we're actually not collectively doing a very good job of setting boundaries and standing up for ourselves in an effective way we're making a lot of noise we're screaming but collectively, what it comes across as, and, and this is not intended to be an insult or not intended to say anybody's doing anything wrong. It, it, it is just that self-awareness that, that people asked for. But what we are communicating to the outside world is, please, sir, can I have another? And that's why we get these very aggressive male feminists trying to protect all the women in gaming. And this is why we get these articles in the press talking about how um, horrible gamers are. Because we don't have advocates that go out there and say, and, and, and have enough support from the community, enough consistent support from the community, and, and understand media in general enough to go okay look you look at this and see this but this is really what is going on there's a real fear of technology right now instead of a healthy respect for technology for all the oh cyberspace is so terrifying if somebody targets you and i speak from experience on this if somebody targets you in cyberspace, it can be embarrassing. It's definitely annoying. And it, it can affect your, your job. It can't physically hurt you. It's not what people in Aleppo are going through. It's not what the Yazidi are going through. It's not, you know what child soldiers throughout Africa are going through. It's, you know, it's not even the incredibly unsafe 
situations faced by many people in Europe right now because of the migrant crisis. And I say people because it's the refugees and the locals that are now being terrorized by these imported street gangs, you know, and we need to be grateful for that. And we need to keep a sense of perspective when it, it comes to these debates. And it, it just seems to me like there's too many people that think that in, unless you make your issue sound like the worst thing in the friggin' world, no one will pay attention to it. And I haven't found that. I find that if you present something as, look, let's keep this in bounds and there's a really simple fix for it, it gets done because it's easy and it's not a political powder keg. It can get done with, with relatively little effort. And I know this sounds counterintuitive, but this is just the way things work. But I did promise you positives. And I'll take the remaining time before we crack the hour to say that. I know that I tend to address just criticisms on Feedback Friday. That is what Feedback Friday is about. Now, I'm trying to figure out how to say this. I'm trying more and more to... Split the difference. Sorry about the pause. I'm, I'm just trying to word this very carefully because I know there are people looking to jump on everything I say. I am trying to split the difference into having a respectful dialogue with people who are critical. But I also feel like I need to reward people who are positive. Like the lady who commented that she's not a gamer, but... She watched my video on quiet. So when, you know, uh, her son or her nephew or something like that started talking about Metal Gear, she at least had a clue what he was talking about and could engage him in conversation. That's amazing. You know, that stuff's amazing. There is positives happening. And my concern is that I've had, especially through Patreon, I've had multiple people messaging me sheepishly on Patreon. It's like, no, God, one of the privileges of being a patron is that you can use that direct message service. Please do not feel sheepish about using it. That's what it's for, okay? If, if you're actually supporting me and my content, you absolutely have the right to use that function, okay? That is a perk, and I wish I could do more perks for patrons, but I am one person and I am way behind on stuff. I'm trying to figure out how to properly fund this channel right now because it's put up or shut up time. And so, but what, what they're saying is that they are still not comfortable commenting publicly. So they're using private services to talk about it because it's usually about things <laughs> and Pinky's found something you may hear that he's like I got something awesome um, but but what it usually is is a very personal thing about something that a piece of content I did made them feel better about in themselves and they're usually men there aren't that many um vocal female participants in my content who actually like <laughs> what I do because most of them, not all, but a great many of the most vocal people who engage with my content are feminist critics. They're rad femme critics and that's fine. That's what they do. That's what they exist to do. They think I'm actually harming women with my content, I think that they're in the realm of problematic so they can shove it. I know, I know the research and I know the material enough to believe what I am doing is actually the best course forward. Otherwise I wouldn't do it. But it still bothers me that there is so much negative in the discussion that people are afraid to discuss positives in public. And I get it because if something is positive for you, you don't want people shitting on it because that's 
minimizing the positive quality. Something made you feel good. You don't want to expose it to something that makes you feel bad. And I thought it was so poignant in the James Desborough um, interview that here's a guy who has done some pretty awesome writing. I mean, I've been, I've been periodically, you know, tweeting back and forth with James. I had no idea he was so accomplished. I knew he did stuff in gaming, but I didn't know what. And I saw his resume. Oh, damn. Munchkin's awesome, you know. But I do think collectively, and this can start with us. We can, we can set the example. I do think that gaming needs to celebrate our positives, needs to celebrate our accomplishments, and needs to celebrate the things we love about this industry more. The, the press and the publishers, they're obsessed with negatives. And there seems to be this discomfort with flying the flag. Hey, we did something great. You know, you see critical acclaim or sales figures. You don't see, we created a game that was really freaking fun and people liked it, you know? And I, th I think that's connected to us being easy targets. And I think that's connected to why everything is, is such a garbage fire. The minute we have, try to have a conversation, it's negative. Everything is negative. The entire industry just responds to negatives. And I know I, I experienced that by... A game franchise will have characters or some storyline or something like that that I really, really relate to. And then the next game, it'll be gone. Why? Because some critic found some problematic element of that whole storyline and more and more and more, it's less about people saving the world and, and, and having these, you know, romantic experiences, not... Romantic isn't dating, that's part of it, but romantic, capital R, movement, big emotional experience thing. And everything becomes, oh look, we have a gay character because that gets rewarded. Oh look, we have a trans character because that gets positive headlines. Oh look, we have characters of color and they have no bloody idea what to do with them because the whole purpose was put this in the game. Not, do we have somebody who knows how to write this character? Do we have someone who understands the experience of this character? Do we have somebody who can actually, you know, with confidence and, and without just being completely negative, actually be able to create a human story arc and character for, for this checked box? I'm not seeing that. And that pisses me off. And it pisses me off because... Games used to do that. You know? They used to do that. I think that Zavron and Liliana in, in Dragon Age were better developed queer characters than the, oh, look, she's a lesbian elf, or, oh, look, he's a gay mage, although Dorian was, was pretty good. I just, I think he was hypersexualized to an uncomfortable degree. They they othered him in in their attempts at inclusion. But you know, Zavran is is not straight. He's into dudes as well as as uh women and I personally found his storyline with a male warden more poignant than with the women. The women, it was a trope. With the guys, it's like, oh, here's this guy trying to be this big ladies' man, but secretly, you know, he's into dudes. Struck a real chord in a lot of ways. Um, and Liliana being, my take on her, is she's essentially someone who prefers women, but it's just too convenient a spy technique to seduce men as well. And that that was all, but, you know, people complained it wasn't gay enough, there was no flat-out gay character. <sighs> My God, you know... These same people think I'm just being stupid when I want to see my body type represented in games and not be stripped out because it's evil. Like, 
the double standards are nuts. And that's why it's so important to let creators make the games they want to make. And the publishers need to stop artificially gatekeeping the kind of characters they want to put in games. And the thing I am hearing a lot from developers back channels won't go on the record is they want to put more female characters in games, but the publishers don't want to pay for it. And that's frustrating for them as, as much as anything else, or they think it's too much a hot button or whatever. The developers are not able to tell the stories they want to tell. It's the publishers controlling it. And the publishers are responding to everything being a fight. So we do have to face what's good. We do have to cheer what's good. We do have to figure out how to make things more positive, not in a Pollyanna way, in, in a legitimate way. And I guess I'll focus on this next week because I'm still trying to figure out how to do this. So that's my question for you this week. Because you guys were so supportive of that interview, I was really worried that people would be assholes about it, but the people who went on the attack attacked me. And I, fine, just don't attack the guest. Um, but how do we do this? How do we focus on the positive? What's a way that isn't going to feel weird? And I know we've talked about this before, but I think we're further along now. And this, this bears readdressing. What? What can we do where there's still trust that this isn't just sales, but that we can sort of celebrate not everybody has to like the games, everybody likes, but how do we allow people to have differences of opinion, but make the paradigm more positive? How do we do this? I'm looking forward to your thoughts. So looking forward to your response to that. Have a great weekend and we'll be back on Mountain Monday.